Okay, we're ready to get started. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to begin by welcoming you to the WVU College of Law for the Charles E. Bayliss Lecture, Climate Change, Our Biggest Challenge. I'd like to recognize Dean Jean Salento, who is here from the College of Engineering and Mineral Resources. Any other deans that I may have missed who are in the room are professors from the College of Law and any other distinguished guests who are with us today. I also would like to begin this session this morning by saying that it is only appropriate that the College of Engineering and, and the College of Law host this lecture together, as Mr. Bayliss is an alumnus of both colleges. He earned his master's in electrical engineering in 1971 from the College of Engineering. Now listen very carefully to this. He earned his JD from the College of Law in 1972, one year later. Go figure. He, his son graduated from the College of Law in 2005. And in addition, he earned his MBA from the University of Michigan, and we'll just have to forgive him for that, for not having a, a, a clean streak there. Um, he is actually an amazing person, human being, but also one of the most respected uh, leaders, thought leaders on climate change, particularly a thought leader on climate change who can speak to industry um, and industry representatives in a way that they can hear. He has often served as an expert witness before the U.S. Congress on issues related to energy. As you might expect, he has a very long list of accomplishments, including serving as the provost of w WVU Tech, where he earned his initial engineering degree. He's the former chairman, president, and CEO of Illinova Corporation, which he merged with Dynegy in February 2000 to create a global energy company. He previously served as chairman, president, and CEO of Unisource Energy. He serves on the boards of several energy and energy-related technology companies, including Edison Electric Institute, Trigen Energy Corporation, the Electric Power Research Institute, and E3 Green Tech. He has published numerous articles about electric competition and energy policy in national and trade publications, and I learned today at lunch that he speaks often on climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Mr. Charles Bayliss. Thank you very much. Uh, I should also welcome uh, two of my friends who I reported to, President Hardesty when I was at Tech and in the very back row. I don't know why he's so bashful back there, Jerry Lang, who was provost. For the engineers in the audience, if you haven't figured it out, I put this up just to drive engineers nuts. Uh, you're dividing by zero there, and you can't divide by zero, as you know. So let's talk about climate change. Recently, uh, like last week, the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Study came out. It was the latest in a long line of studies. At Berkeley, they went and looked at 39,390 weather stations for the last 50 years and used some very good statistical analysis. Now, I will point out that later I'm going to tell you you can download this presentation, you can have it, use it. But on each of the slides, there are sites. The URL for this study is on there, so you can go see it. But what they've done is invited everybody to take a shot at it. Have we made a mistake? People don't think they did because it came right out on top of the NASA study, the NOAA study, the Hadley Center in Europe study on climate change. And what it shows that we have had a climate change of about a degree and a half or so, just in you know, a degree or so in the last uh, 50 years. And this is rather unequivocal data. You can measure this. This is not conjecture. Now, people could say it's a natural cycle. We'll get into that. But anyway, that's where it is now. This is not fiction. <clears throat> in the scientific community, in many communities, there's a lot of debate. Is there or is there not? In the scientific community, there's no debate on whether there's climate change. These are just a partial list of organizations that have come out and said that humans are causing climate change. A couple of the National Ocean, you know, NOAA as we know it, has come out and said that. Another one that has come out 
is the National Centre for Atmospheric Research and the Royal Society of the UK. The Royal Society is the world's oldest scientific academy. <clears throat> and what they have said, if we get to four degrees, we're already at a degree or so, there's already another degree and a half baked in, as we will see. If we were to stop now, we'd still go up another degree and a half. In such a four degree world, the limits of adaptation for most natural systems would be exceeded. They could not adapt, and for many human systems. The Royal Academy also says that we face a, quote, hellish future that with, it's going to be like Mr. Kirk and, or Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock getting off in the rain and the wind and stuff like that. Now, I joke that, uh, you know, good, with the oceans rising, we can have both hell and high water, so we might as well get both of them, not just one of them. The National Academy of Sciences was established by President Lincoln, and it was asked by Congress about, you know, a few months ago. National Academy stated climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities, and in many cases is already affecting a broad range of natural systems. In the scientific community, there is no debate about whether it is happening or not. 98 point some percent of the climate scientists even agree with what's called the consensus position. There's one percent that argues nits within the consensus position. But it is happening. And what we're going to do now is look at climate change. And I'm going to start off and look at some of the science and try to put it in terms that are fairly easy to understand. And I can tell you, you're not going to need anything more than freshman college or high school physics to understand this. High school physics and Evie, and a couple things I'll talk about that are in a freshman book, but they're fairly easy to understand. Climate change was first mentioned way, way back when by a Swedish guy and another guy, John Tyndall. It was first postulated by Mr. Fourier. Every engineer is familiar with the Fourier transform and things like that. And he, he noted that the sun's continually heating us up. We've got to have some way of getting rid of this heat. What's going on? And he postulated, and we will talk a little bit later, to show you that it is not a trivial problem. In 2011, the world will emit 35 billion tons of CO2. Now, look, that's a number we can't understand, but let me give you a number you can understand. That comes out to 2 million pounds a second. Every single second, we emit 2 million pounds of man-made or anthropogenic carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. That's just CO2 into our atmosphere, and there's other greenhouse gases that go along with it. A thousand megawatt coal plant, a big coal plant, burns about a million pounds of coal an hour. Every single hour, one million pounds of coal. Now, if you assume the coal is 85% carbon, that's three million pounds of CO2 an hour that every thousand megawatt coal plant. Now, don't go feeling too smug and say it's all our fault in the coal and in the utility industry, which I am a part of, and I've been there for years, although I'm gradually trying to get them to reform as much as I can. Don't get too smug. Every gallon of gasoline, according to EPA, I've used 20. The actual EPA number is 19.7 for gas, 20.4 for diesel. So I just said, every time you fill your car up and you burn a gallon of gas, you are emitting 20 pounds of CO2. So if you drive 12,500 miles in a year, I'd say 25 miles per gallon. That's 500 gallons, okay? And that's, you can do the math, 10,000 pounds of CO2 that you're putting into the atmosphere. So don't, you know, don't get too upset with the coal companies. Now let's start looking at the science. The sun's energy coming in at the top of the atmosphere is about 1,361 watts per every square meter. And we measure this. This is not, again, this is not a conjecture. You put satellites up and you measure it, and you can tell exactly what it is. That's the peak. Now, obviously, the sun doesn't shine at night. And up on the, you know, the sun, that's here, at this square meter over here where the sun's hitting it obliquely, it might only be 40 or 50 square watts per meter. So the average of the Earth's sun receiving, the average square meter receives 342 watts. Keep that number in mind. We're going to use that later. 342 watts per square meter. Now, I think most of you know, but it just, you know, just refresh the first law. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. This is a diagram of a cogen combined cycle power plant. 
And I will tell you that we trace energy on this down to the nth degree, to the second, third decimal places. We've never lost any. We've never gained any. It's always there. It never leaves. If it does leave, we know where it went. And so energy can neither be created nor destroyed. All of that sun's energy is coming in has to go somewhere. It cannot be destroyed. It either heats things up or it's going back into space. It has no other choice. That's where it's going. The energy balance of the earth. If you look at a little house, that's my house there, if you're putting more energy in than is going out, it's going to heat up and vice versa. And so the earth is like the house. If we're putting more energy in than is going out, it's going to heat up. So why isn't the earth in a runaway heating mode? We're getting energy from the sun every day. Where is it going? So let's, let's look at that. This is the energy coming in from the sun up here on the red. You see this red line up on top? That's the total energy. This is frequency here and wavelength. And we'll talk about that in a little minute. So this red comes in. As that energy comes down through the atmosphere, some of it's absorbed. A good example is clouds. Clouds absorb it. You can tell that when you look at the sun and there's no sun there because there's a cloud there. That water vapor in that cloud is absorbing the sun's energy. But there's a lot of other things, carbon dioxide, oxygen, methane, nitrous oxide. This is called Rayleigh scattering. That's why the sky's blue. It only works on short wavelength high frequency, and it causes those part of the, the blue to bounce around. That's why the blue appears to be coming from everywhere. And so that is what's coming in. And the little notches here, you see are right over these. The solid red surface is what actually hits the Earth's surface because some of it, where there are notches, was absorbed up in the atmosphere. So that's what's coming in. Now, how, is it, how do we get rid of it? Well, let's think about back to seventh grade science probably. Ninth grade, I don't know when science is taught now in the high school. There's three methods you can get rid of heat. Conduction. Okay, that's where you put hot on one end of a metal bar and it spreads to the other end. Convection. Convection is where you actually move it, like a fan moving air. That's convection. And the other method is radiation. Every body, single, every object in the universe radiates energy away. And it radiates by what's called black body energy. This laser pointer, this, you know, everything radiates energy. So how does the Earth get rid of energy? Conduction is not going to work. There's nothing outside our atmosphere to conduct to, so that won't work. Convection's not working. Anybody seen any big chunks of the atmosphere tearing away lately and going into outer space and taking energy with it? Nope. So the only way the Earth has of losing energy is radiation, period. That's it. That's how we lose energy. I suppose when the space shuttle goes up, it takes some. But other than that, you know, minor little things like that, that's the only way we have of losing energy is radiation. So let's, let's, we've got to understand this radiation if we're going to understand climate change because it's an energy balance. Energy in is the sun. Energy out is the radiation. You've got to know just a little bit about frequency, and I assume most of you do, but I put this in there. Frequency of a light wave, uh, electromagnetic radiation, is just is it vibrating slow or fast, and the faster is the higher frequency. But note if it's vibrating fast, then this frequency here, this is called the wavelength from one to the other, you know, when it's full. Here's the wavelength here. Higher frequency, shorter wavelength. So scientists talk in both. You'll hear some people say high frequency, well, that also means short wavelength. Some people say low frequency, well, that means high wavelength. They're, they're, they go like this, frequency up, wavelength down, and vice versa. And so we need to know frequency and wavelength. Black body radiation, a Mr. Stefan Boltzmann discovered a law back in 1879, the Stefan Boltzmann law that says every single object in the universe radiates energy. And it radiates energy according to this very simple formula. The total radiated energy is the Stefan Boltzmann constant times temperature to the fourth power. That's it. It's very simple to understand. So, you know, the parking meter does, the iceberg does, everything. Everybody in this room radiates energy. And Planck was a scientist who won a Nobel Prize, obviously, for Planck's law. And it says the energy contained in a light wave, an electromagnetic radiation, is very simply a Planck's constant times the frequency. The higher the frequency, the more energy. And that makes sense if you think about it. Does this wave or this wave have more energy in it? Well, clearly this one does. And so <clears throat> that's Planck's law. 
And the next one, and really the last one we're going to consider, is Wine's Law. Wine then started looking, well, we know that a body radiates energy depending upon how hot it is. The hotter T to the fourth, it'll radiate more. But where does it radiate? At what frequency and wavelength does it radiate? Well, it turns out that if the temperature is really, 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 really hot, like some sort of weird star, it's going to radiate gamma radiation, very high energy. And that makes sense. Planck's law, the high frequency radiation has more energy. So then, you know, something that's very high in energy is going to radiate high frequency. You get cooler, colder, down to the sun. Well, you know, it's not very cold, but it's somewhat cold compared to a white dwarf or something. It radiates in the frequency of visible light. And we just happen to be able to see that. And it just so happens that's where our sun radiates. That's good. You get down to the Earth, and we're radiating energy. You can't see it, but we are. We're going to talk about that. And that's called infrared radiation. Now, infrared is nothing but light, but you can't see it. You can't see ultraviolet either. You can't see x-rays. You, know, you can't see gamma rays, but they're there. We in the utility industry use infrared radiation all the time. We take infrared cameras, and we take pictures of transmission lines, substations, to see where hot spots are on the lines. We take pictures of houses to say, well, you really need some insulation here because it's a lot of heat coming out. You can't see the infrared, but it is there. Every single object in this room right now is radiating infrared energy away. This is a really good photograph if you're into climate change. <clears throat> it's a picture of a man with a garbage bag. <laughs> Great. What the heck does that mean? Well, <clears throat> what it means, let's look at the same picture taken with an infrared camera. This is a NASA picture. Note, the garbage bag is transparent. All right? The point here, it's so critical, is that different objects, different molecules react differently to different frequencies. Visible light cannot go through the garbage bag. Infrared just passes right through it. All right? Humans, as you note, the man is really quite bright here. We emit about 2,000 calories a day of infrared radiation. All the civil engineers in the room know that. If you're designing a building, you need to know how many people are going to be in that building to design the HVAC system because the people are putting off heat. <clears throat> Important. Now, again, the plastic bag, different things react differently. But something even more important, look at the guy's glasses. The glasses are transparent to visible light, but they will not let infrared through. Glass blocks infrared light. That leads to greenhouses. What happens in a greenhouse? The visible light comes in, goes right through the glass, it hits something, gets absorbed, it heats it up. That something emits infrared radiation, bounce. It cannot go through the light, through the glass, just like the gas glasses. And so the inside of the greenhouse heats up. Now, if you don't believe this works, you better run over. You can, Dean Salento here, Tell him to go to the ag people. They're spending like $12 million on a new greenhouse. So if you don't think this works, you know, if you don't believe in greenhouse effect, you better go tell them to save the money. Dean McConnell or Dean Salento, either one can use it. <clears throat> and so the earth, this is really important. This is the energy coming in. We can see it. It's visible light. The energy that we're radiating out is the same amount, but it is entirely different. It is infrared energy. We can't see it. But the amount here in blue has got to be the same as here. The energy in must equal the energy out. But it's a different frequency. Well, look down here, the wavelengths, the absorptions down here. Things that are absorbing energy are different here than they are here. And so actually, only in this one hole here does most of the energy make it through. That's the blue. That goes right back to the sky, to the sp outer space. This energy is absorbed in the atmosphere. It's always been that way. This is nothing new. It's been that way for a long time. Why is it absorbed? Well, CO2 molecules can vibrate, and they have little masses, and it's like the, the binding energy is like a spring, and if you're an engineer, you know that K, the spring constant, and the mass, you can figure out the frequency, and that's what it does. <clears throat> we use this. In engineering, we use infrared spectroscopy. We can shine an infrared light of varying frequencies into something and see what's absorbed and say, hey, we know what's in there. Okay, they use this. This is not, again, new science or anything like that. For non believers, if you do not believe that different elements, different molecules react differently to different light, you also don't believe 
in color greenhouses. Color is nothing more than that. This is pink. It's reflecting pink light. And, uh, you know, it's not, re and it's absorbing blue light, it's absorbing green light, et cetera, yellow and blue. And so different colors. You don't also believe in ultraviolet blocking sunglasses, CAT scanners, computer IR ports, et cetera, et cetera. We use this all the time. It's not rocket science. No one's making this up for the greenhouse effect. And so the atmosphere absorbs this IR going out, and that heats the atmosphere. Now, greenhouse gases are good. <clears throat> if it was not for this absorption, the temperature of the Earth would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit, the average temperature. As it is, it's 59. So these greenhouse gases have warmed us for hundreds of years, thousands, millions of years, and they continue to warm us today. And there's just a few of men, people say, oh, it's only a trace amount of CO2. Yeah, but it's really done a pretty good job for all these years of keeping us warm. People say, well, you know, how do you know that? Well, luckily, we have something called the moon. And the moon is the same average distance from the sun as the earth, but it has no atmosphere. Turns out the average temperature of the moon is about 10 below. Now you say, oh, that's not zero. You said zero. Well, the moon has a different reflectivity. What do we call the earth? The reason I put this in, the, quote, blue planet, right? BBC called it that. What does that mean? Well, that means it's reflecting blue light, it's absorbing yellow and red. Does that sound familiar? If it were a white planet, it would be reflecting everything. A blue planet, it is absorbing yellow and red. We know that, and it's absorbing other things. But the moon has actually a higher reflectivity. It's whiter, and so it reflects more sunlight away, and it is minus 10 degrees. It's the same average distance from the sun, so you don't have to go looking at other planets. And this is the way it works to get the equilibrium. Let's say the Earth was a frozen ice ball. It doesn't look like it here, but it's zero degrees Kelvin. I mean, absolute zero, flat out zero. And suddenly the sun comes on. The Earth starts getting sunlight. And so it's not very hot, so it doesn't emit much. So energy in is more than energy out. Well, then it starts emitting, heats up and emits more. And it keeps heating up until it gets to the point where the incoming energy is equal to the outgoing energy. And at that point, an equilibrium has been reached, and we reach that. Now, other plants, but at that point, you can calculate what that would be, and it's zero degrees Fahrenheit based on the reflectivity or what we call the albedo of the Earth, zero degrees Fahrenheit. If you look at the Earth, okay, it should be zero, it's 59. You look at Venus, it's 855. And you say, well, duh, it's closer to the sun. Come on. That's true. But let's look at some other facts. It should be 120. Mercury is even closer to the sun than Venus, but it's only 300. Why? Because the atmosphere of Venus is 96% carbon dioxide, the greenhouse effect going wild. And that obviously kicks Venus up quite a bit. It's much warmer than you would expect. It's not the fact that it's closer to the sun. Mercury's even closer to the sun. Now, this is where the inevitability of climate change sort of leaps out at you. The only way we have of getting rid of heat is radiation. You say, well, look, okay, so the atmosphere is absorbing more. As we put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they're absorbing more of the radiation that's being emitted. Fine. But look, you know, can't we open a window or something, like a house? You know, if we can get rid of that heat, it won't heat up. That's absolutely right, if we can get rid of it. But we only have one way of getting rid of it, and that is radiation. And this is, as I said, where climate change is going to leap out at you. Energy in. Energy out, convection doesn't work, conduction doesn't work, radiation. Let's look at the formula for radiation. Bad news. If we want to radiate more heat, there's only one variable in the formula. That's temperature. T has to go up. There's no other way. Four's not going to go up. The Stefan-Boltzmann constant's not going to go up. T must go up. And so once you're to the point where we are trapping more energy, then we have got to go up to get rid of that energy, because that's the only way we have of getting rid of it, is, is radiation. So it's not a question of whether the Earth's going to get warmer, may get warmer, might get warmer, could get warmer. It must get warmer. It absolutely must get warmer if we're going to radiate more energy in space because that's the only thing we've got to get rid of. 
Now, this is the Earth's heat balance. I won't go through this too much. But the energy comes in. A lot of the blue is radiated away. The red, the green, the yellow comes down and hits the Earth here. And so this is the Earth uh, out. If we look, or This is Earth in here. Going out, we've got thermals and evaporation. Remember, it takes 80 or 540 calories per gram to, to turn water to steam. And then you have the radiant energy going out. This is actually the, the radiation, surface radiation. And then it goes up, and some of it makes it through. Others, it gets absorbed by the greenhouse gases. This is the way it is. This is not the way greenhouse gases have been this way for years, millions. And then these... It might come here and get absorbed, radiated, absorbed, radiated, absorbed, radiated. It might get absorbed and radiated. Some goes out. Finally, when it gets to the top, the radiation goes out. Others comes back down. So the total Earth in is the 168 plus the 324. Earth out, 24, 78, and 390. And the total at the top of the atmosphere is the 107 uh, coming there and the 235 over there. That's the Earth's energy balance. But we're messing with it by changing the amount that gets a free pass the first time to go through. And so as we add greenhouse gases, we're going to put more absorption in here. It will absorb more, <clears throat> and things will heat up. Now, this is not conjecture. NASA looks at this constantly. And there's a couple satellites went up. And they're looking at down. And they're saying, what are we seeing coming up from the Earth in radiation? And the baseline here is 1971. And if you look at what's going into space now from Earth, it's that. And guess what? These notches are right where carbon dioxide and methane are. Now, if that energy isn't going into warming, where else is it going? Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It's either going into melting ice, heating water, heating air, heating surface, heating my laser pointer. It's going into heating something. Can't be created nor destroyed. And so, as I, I joke, the Vice President Gore wrote a book about an inconvenient truth. If you're a denier, this is an inconvenient graph because that's just a graph. This can be measured. This is not calculations. This is measurements. Where is that energy going if it's not going into the Earth? And another graph at the same time, others, including NASA, have looked up and said, what's the infrared radiation that's being radiated back down to the Earth's surface? Because as the atmosphere heats up, you will get more radiation coming down. And in fact, they found that that infrared, infrared radiation is coming back down. <clears throat> People have calculated then, well, we know that energy is not going out, and you integrate that over the whole area of the Earth, and you say, well, how much energy is that? And it is a lot. It is added about 2.2 watts to the 342 that we're talking about. But in more stark terms, they have calculated that this extra energy that's not being radiated is equal to about 13 Hiroshima-sized bombs every second. That's what we're adding to our biosphere. Non-believers, as I joke, you can get a trip to Stockholm if you can disprove the Stefan Boltzmann equation, Wine's displacement law, infrared spectroscopy, whatever. I always joke when people say that uh, there's a conspiracy among scientists just so they can get more funding. And I say, okay, here's your Here's your options. You can either believe that 50,000 scientists worldwide, most of whom don't even know each other, have engaged and managed to pull off this great conspiracy when any one of them could break it and get the Nobel Prize, probably all the Nobel Prizes in one year if they could disprove climate change, or that certain groups of political figures and others who are trying to tell us what we want are saying that there is no climate change. You can, you can take your pick on that one. CO2 concentrations over the years have gone steadily up. <clears throat> they go up and down. What happens is in the summer, look where the land mass of the Earth is. It's all up in the northern hemisphere. So in the summer up here, there's a lot of trees. It goes down. In the winter up here, it goes up. And so it goes this. This is from a Mauna, Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. This is what's actually happened to CO2 concentrations. This is a NASA JPL <clears throat> in the last few years. I'm going to skip that one. One of the things that's interesting, if you notice that first graph I put up from BEST, the surface temperature, it went like this and it leveled off, and then it went like this. And I joke, we in the utility industry had this under control until the EPA came along and made us stop acid rain. Because the, the particulates from sulfur 
in the atmosphere reflect light back into space. And that has kept that, that actually caused that flat portion of the curve, but once we had to cut out the sulfur particulates, the curve started back up. The Chinese have actually done a pretty good job of this in the last couple of years of putting a lot of sulfur particulates in the atmosphere. Feedback. Let's just talk a few minutes about feedback. But one of the big feedbacks is there's about 4% more water vapor average in the air today than there was in 1950. And A, that's a major greenhouse gas, so it's going to get more. But <clears throat> more clouds. And people say, well, clouds are a negative forcing because what the happen, the cloud will reflect energy back. That's true. But we live in the winter in Tucson, and in Tucson it's nothing to have a 40-degree difference day to night. Why? Because there's no clouds, and at night the infrared radiation scoots right through. So while clouds do reflect it back during the day, they trap it at night and keep it warm. And the overall forcing is probably positive on that. One of the things that feedback has done, though, is it's proved that very small changes in forcing can lead to large changes in output. The forcing that caused the ice ages really wasn't that much, and these, but these feedback mechanisms are still with us today. Let's talk about tipping points. A tipping point, weather is what's called a chaotic system, and that doesn't mean it's run random. The engineers that have taken chaos theory and nonlinear non dynamics know a lot about this, but it's a system where teeny changes in output can cause major input, can cause major changes in output. It was invented by Dr. Ed Lorenz at MIT studying weather, and it is the classic chaotic system. So a tipping point is something that just that little change in output not only causes this much of a change in input, it causes this much and throws you over to a whole other state of the system. I joke that communism had a major tipping point, and suddenly it wasn't there. Look at the Arab nations now, but communism literally within six months collapsed. This is a picture I took in Shanghai. This is the building that Mao Zedong, Chu and Lai formed the Chinese Communist Party, and today towering over it, Price Waterhouse Coopers, big U.S. accounting firm. Took this one in Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, and you see the hammer and sickle. Today, Tower and Orbit, you can't see it, but that building at the top says Citibank. And my favorite, this is a picture in Yalta in the Ukraine of the typical statue of Lenin, and you'll immediately pick up on the tipping point here. Okay? And so all of a sudden, communism was gone. And, and so tipping points happen in weather systems, too. One of the big ones that everybody worries about, a clathrate, if you're not an engineer, it's a solid substance, it's a lattice, and, and you can get things trapped inside the lattice. And there's a lot of methane trapped in clathrates. <clears throat> Probably more methane than the total amount of natural gas that we have in the world. And if those clathrates ever melt, that methane will be discharged. And the real one that I worry about is methane and permafrost. There's a tons and tons of methane in the permafrost. And that is the area that is melting the quickest. And when that melts and leaves, we're going to throw ourselves into an absolute disaster state. There's also negative tipping points. A lot of people think that the sun is declining now, and it is. Uh, it, it absolutely is. And even so, the temperature is still going up. But that will help the forcing, but not by much. <clears throat> now, a lot of people say, look, okay, it's warming, but it's a natural cycle. We've had warming all of our history. And I say that's true, but let me point out, that is a natural flying machine. That does not preclude man-made flying machines. That is a natural lake, like Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. That is an artificial lake. Just because there's natural cycles doesn't mean you can't have man-made cycles, and we're getting that now. And so the changes in the atmosphere are not entirely man-made. There are other changes. A volcano will throw particulates and cool for years if it's a big volcano. The El Nino, La Nino, or the, the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, what's called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, a huge weather oscillation, will absolutely cause changes in weather. But that doesn't mean we can't also. Now, as the El Nino releases heat, it really makes the climate go up. A lot of climate change deniers, you see this one on some of the Fox programs, say 1998 was the hottest year. They're going to have to stop saying that because 2011 is probably going to be. But, yeah, it was because that was a huge El Nino effect. And they point to this little graph here. See this graph? It went from there down to there. And I pretty much agree with that. That's the rest of the graph you saw earlier. <clears throat> 
The solar forcing. The sun absolutely varies its intensity as it strikes Earth with. There's actually several effects, but the three main ones are the sun, when it first goes up, it's not a perfectly circular orbit. And that orbit, the eccentricity of how long and narrow it gets varies over time. And we know that. And the eccentricity varies in 100,000 year cycles. The axial tilt, the Earth doesn't always keep the same tilt. That varies in 40,000 year cycles. Precession, the Earth wobbles. That's uh, 26,000. We know all of these. These were published first by a Serbian guy, Milan Milankovic, Milankovic who, who published them first. We know this, and we've calculated all of them. <clears throat> and they're not causing the current forcing. You cannot explain the current changes in weather by looking at these natural cycles. Climate re change to, re responds to whatever the dominant forcing is, and today it's human activity. Solar forcing has actually gone down. These are the solar cycles that I was talking about earlier. And it's actually gone down in the last few years. It should be cooling now rather than warming. Another thing that's interesting, if it was solar, all the other planets would be warming. They're not, sorry. Neptune, or Pluto is not a planet anymore, but it came inside the orbit of Neptune. It's closer to the sun. It's got warmer. Mars is. Mars had a big dust storm. They have an atmosphere, and the albedo, the reflectivity changed. They're absorbing more heat. Saturn's not. Neptune and Pluto and Venus are the same. Uh, all the planets would be getting warmer. <coughs> this is a look at predicted ocean surface temperatures. This is from Scripps. This is an oceanography type place. And they said without forcing, without man-made anthropogenic climate forcing, that's what ocean surface temperatures would do. With it, that's what they do. That's their prediction. That's what actually happened. You can figure out which data set fits the best. This is a graph for like the last 800,000 years from ice cores and stuff of carbon dioxide and temperature. You can probably see a small correlation. That's where we are now on carbon dioxide. The change from the last ice age to now was five degrees. We may well in this 100 year period get a five degree change. Instead of hundreds of thousands of years, we're taking it all in one century. How do we know it's human caused? Well, first off, carbon 12 and 13, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Carbon 14 is created by cosmic rays. So if something's way down in the ground like coal, you're not going to get carbon 14 in it. And so what's happening now is the atmosphere is constantly being depleted in carbon 14. Tells us that the CO2 coming in is depleted in carbon 14. So it's from fossil fuels. Likewise, plants preferentially take up carbon 12. And so the carbon-12 in the atmosphere is going up. The C-13 is going down. What I said, the other planets should be warming. Likewise, if uh, it was the sun, days should be warming faster than nights. They're not. Exactly the opposite is happening because the greenhouse gases are trapping more at the Earth's surface and not letting it out, which is what you'd expect at night. <laughs> the lower atmosphere, you would expect under greenhouse gases to be warming. And this is a NASA. It's exactly what's happening. The lower data where we're trapping all the greenhouse gases is warming. Since that heat doesn't get to the upper atmosphere, it is cooling. That's incidentally causing huge problems with ozone again. The, uh, the, the cold is causing ozone. <clears throat> Let's look at the effects for a while. Climate change has caused the fall of several civilizations and species. Uh, I always joke that, hey, you know, when the Earth was very, very young, little plankton thingies, I'm not a biologist, I don't know what they're called put oxygen into the atmosphere and change the earth substantially. And if the little plankton thingies can do it, we can do it. So who cares? Does anybody here really care whether it's 72 out there today or 74? No, I don't. But let me show you what kind of change we're talking about. That. You think, okay, big deal. Where does the severe weather occur? It occurs out in here, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the heat waves. And look what's happened here. We've increased this by maybe 30, 40 percent, the incidence there. The water vapor. When water vapor condenses, that heat of vaporization is released to the atmosphere. That's what happens in hurricanes and things. And so when it condenses, then that heat goes up and causes more vicious storms. So with 4 percent more water vapor, we're going to get 4 percent more storms, more intense hurricanes. Australia this year has got hammered. I'm on the board of an Australian company. 
just getting hammered dry or they either get monster hurricanes or they get drought and they're getting tired of it. They just passed a bill, uh, a cap and trade carbon tax bill. <clears throat> John King, I was over there, that's the Three Gorges Dam at a conference there and one year they had a drought and couldn't do anything and the next year they were really worried about the dam from a flood. <clears throat> if you look at a graph of extreme weather events, now, one of the things that scientists quickly realized a lot of this could be to reporting. So they looked at a graph of earthquakes, figuring that the same reporting would pick up earthquakes. And if you normalize this for this, then you get this, and it's still going up. The insurance companies are going nuts. The insurance companies, I will guarantee you, Munich Ray, et cetera, absolutely believe in climate change. They're starting to price it in. They are worried to death. There have been more billion-dollar events this year than ever before, and we've, like, double. I mean, it's, it's incredible. <clears throat> but so what? If only temperature and storm intensity was there, we'd say, okay, fine. But weather is nature's way of redistributing energy. We get more energy at the poles, less there. And as we have more energy to redistribute, it's going to get more and more severe weather. And the weather patterns are going to change, and I know this will shock you, but climate change then. The actual climate will change from like desert to tropical to tropical to desert. Climate change is going to be the main problem with climate change. And I know that sounds facetious, but that will be the main effect is you will have very fertile areas changing into dust bowls, Texas being one of the logic. If you give a cook two sets of ingredients, they're going to give you two different meals. Same with the atmosphere. You give the atmosphere two different set of ingredients. And remember, atmosphere is a chaotic system. Very small changes make a difference in output. We're now talking about major changes. <clears throat> One of the big changes will be in the Hadley cell. In weather, the Hadley cell, warm air goes up here, and as it goes up, it loses its moisture. It rains down here, and it comes up, and it comes back down. And this is where we get deserts, the Sahara, the Gobi, the Southwest Desert. And the polar cell, air goes down here, comes up here like this, and then the, this is this, the result of the Hadley cell and the polar cell. As we put a lot more energy into this, most people think the Hadley cell is going to expand up into here. What that will entail is that we will have massive drought. I think Texas is starting to see it this year. I would not be wanting to buy farm property in Texas. This is a thing from the, this is the United States government. This is the National Center for Atmospheric Research. <clears throat> During the Dust Bowl, the uh, temporary will hit minus three. NCAR is saying by the end of this century that it will go down to minus eight to minus 10 in parts in the southern part of the United States and could fall to minus 10 to 15 in the Mediterranean. You can kiss Italian grapes and wine goodbye. That's what they're saying it will look like. That will cause huge worldwide changes in the food system, in the living conditions, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have massive drought. Sea level rise. <clears throat> Some nations are going to disappear. I'm going to be in South Africa in January, so my wife and I are going to the Seychelles for Christmas. We're going to go somewhere. And they're going, to, they're going to be gone. I would highly suggest if you want to visit the Maldives or the Seychelles or any of those islands that you do so in the next 20 years. Now, some people say, oh, it'll be great for Canadian agriculture. It might be. But the poor nations are not going to be able to adapt. I'm going to skip that one. People say, well, you can't say that tornado or that hurricane was due to climate change. Absolutely. We can't say that any. Go out and look at a cloud today if there are any. Tell me what caused that cloud. We've never been able to look at something and say, oh, that cloud was caused by this or that. Maybe the output for Mount Storm or I mean, Fort Martin or something. You can say, oh, that cloud was caused by Fort Martin. But <clears throat> as events are happening, dust bowls in Texas, droughts, floods, hotter summer temperatures, we're breaking, we're having 100-year events. They've become the new 10-year event. If you look, I don't have it on here, there's a graph of new all-time high set versus new all-time low set. And the all-time highs look like this and the all-time lows look like that. If all of the anomalous temperature events, if we're moving farther and farther away from the norm and they're all moving in one direction, and that's the direction predicted by climate change, pretty soon you're starting to say, well, we think it is climate change. Now, we can't predict weather 30 days out. But does that mean there's not going to be weather? I'll guarantee you we cannot predict the exact effects of climate change. 
but we can't predict what our own weather system that we've studied for hundreds of years is going to do 30 days out either. And so don't let the fact that people say, well, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. It's going to get hotter, the weather is going to get more violent, and it's going to change. Can we tell you how exactly? No. But I can't tell you what the weather is going to be one month from the day either. <clears throat> A lot of people say, if you looked outside, this was last winter. This is our home in Tucson. That's snow. Snow doesn't happen in Tucson, all right? This, this, this doesn't happen. <clears throat> and it was really cold last winter. You've got to look at, as the newscaster Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. This is a NASA graph that shows the cold here. But look at the anomaly of warm up here. It was so warm up here that they broke temperature records left and right. There were many days up here where they never got down to their all-time high. They never got down that far. And I actually had to cancel snowmobile races, which was a disaster. But yeah, it was cold down here. And what happened was the Arctic oscillation. Normally around the pole, the polar cell, as I was saying, that cold air is coming down, spreads out, and due to the Coriolis effect, it goes like this. It was so warm up there last year that that broke down and fell way down. And when something comes down, something else must go up, and that's what happened. And we got the polar air. I mean, even in Tucson, I mean, we were freezing. I mean, it was really a disaster. I, I joke that, you know, we're suffering along with you. It actually got down to 40 degrees. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> now, another thing I say after you, I'm not going to go through this. It was a really incredibly funny book. But it turns out the Earth was a computer, according to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I would submit, well, it is a computer. And we don't need to calculate what's going to happen. We can look. This is from the Audubon Society. That's how species are migrating north. Notice north. A couple are sort of strange. They're going east. I don't know why. Maybe they're Ohio State fans or something. But look at how all the bird species are migrating. You don't see any going south. And as the climate changes, it's going to have drastic effects on the ecosystem because these birds, like these little red knots, they're supposed to get to Delaware when the crab eggs are hatching. They go from Antarctica to the Arctic every year. And if they don't get there, they're going to, if the crab eggs are not there, they will die. So if the crab eggs start four weeks earlier, they will be toast. <clears throat> Huge amounts of trees have been killed. Let's we'll speak a minute about the polar regions. This is where climate change is the, the worst. As the polar ice melts, the albedo, the reflectivity changes radically. Look, if this is ice, sunlight comes in, it's going right back out. It's so reflective. But if this is dirt, it's going to absorb it. And that'll make it even hotter, which will melt more ice. And it's a real feedback effect. And that feedback is the big reason the poles are moving. This is a NASA graph. They looked down and they said, how much is being radiated out? And in 1979, this was the, Syro, the, the ice sphere, the cyrospheric forcing. And it was all being reflected out. Today, that area around the pole is absorbing every year seven times more energy than humans use in a year. And that even melts more ice, which makes more dirt, which makes more problem. And it is runaway up there already. <clears throat> this is the Arctic sea ice extent. And there's a site on there. This is from what's the, the NSIDC.org, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. <clears throat> and the percent of old ice is decreasing. Reached the lowest level ever. Record ice melting in Greenland. I mean, I could just go on and on on what's happening. I've, I spent a year in Greenland. And uh, I can tell you it's, it's, really, uh, it's really sad. This was a huge piece of glacier. That's a 100-square-mile chunk of ice breaking off. And this Arctic amplification has another effect. If it's not, if the ice is there, the warm, in quotes, 32 degree, maybe, ocean cannot transfer heat to the 40 below atmosphere. But with the ice gone, that will freeze over. But the less ice means that the ocean can transfer more heat and that will really disrupt weather patterns. Sea level rise is already happening. We can measure it, et cetera, et cetera. The main thing is going to be on the biosphere. This is a penguin colony in Antarctica. When you go ashore in Antarctica, <clears throat> you'll go ashore and there'll be a half a million Adelaide penguins there, or half a million king penguins. It's an amazing thing. I mean, it's acres and acres and acres of penguins. And I just threw this in. It's funny. This is my wife in Antarctica. And Joan is standing there in the path, and the little penguins have to go to the ocean, and they have a path going that way to go to the ocean and a path going this way so they don't run into one another. And this little penguin goes. 
And it's standing there going like this. And I said, honey, there's a little penguin there. And she moves and it just waddles on through. But it was, you could just see the little penguin's brain going, does not compute. You know, why is there a large red object in my path? And it didn't have enough sense to go around. But <clears throat> we're already seeing massive decreases in um, the one type of the Adele penguins. We're seeing massive decreases in them because they require ice flows. Other types of penguins are coming up because they don't. But those type of penguins, if you want to see a good book, it's in the sites. Fraser's Penguins talks all about this. As the glacier system is lost, it will cause major worldwide water problems. You want to know why the Chinese like Tibet so much? Well, there's the Yangtze, there's the Yellow River, there's the Brahmaputra, there's the uh, Mekong, all flow out of Tibet. And that's where most of Southeast Asia's water supply comes from. <clears throat> they love it. This one I shot in the It was in an ice cave in Switzerland looking out. Uh, those are going to be gone. Currently, the Arctic ice and the ocean are sucking up immense amounts of heat. It takes 80 calories per gram to melt ice. <clears throat> Look at all that ice we've been melting. Scientists say that a lot of the melting that is going on right now is going into Arctic ice in the ocean and not raising the temperature. But when that ice is gone, there's nowhere else for it to go. The ocean, this is from Australia, the ocean surface temperatures are absolutely climbing. And ocean acidification is a major problem. Now, it's a logarithmic scale, so this is not as drastic as it sounds. But the concentration of hydrogen ions in the ocean has increased about 30% from ocean acidification. The CO2 going into the ocean, reacting with water, making H2CO3, H2CO3 carbonic acid. And the real problem with this acid, this is not climate change, but it's due to the CO2, <clears throat> is shellfish cannot exist in an acidic solution. They cannot pull the calcium carbonate, the argonite, from the water to make their shells. There's a great book called Our Dying Planet, and it's in the sites by Peter Sale. And he's a very eminent oceanographer. He predicts that within 30 years, we will lose all of our coral reefs. We're already losing them. We've probably lost 20% of our coral reefs worldwide already from acidification. Just about done here. The thing that worries me is this is a graph that I first did in like 1995. That's why it looks so old. I haven't changed it. I loved it. And it shows U.S. electricity consumption. And when we were back here in 1880, we came up and we're up and I don't know where we're going up here. I just drew that. We're actually up about here now. We're actually doing a pretty good job of conserving. <clears throat> when we were back here, we couldn't come up into here because these things, refrigerators, right after World War II, there was a huge boost. Refrigerators, air conditioning, et cetera, they hadn't been invented. In China and in India, not only have they been invented, they make them. They are coming up, this per capita energy use cur curve, every year what it took us two and a half years to do. They're using, and I'm not blaming them. I... Love, I go to China often. I love the Chinese. I mean, most industrious, hardworking. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but when you walk into the library at a Chinese university at midnight, it's full. Sorry. <laughs> we have other places that are full, but maybe not libraries. But the, this, this, is, this is what is really scary, is the rest of the world is now coming up and wants to look at, use the energy per capita that we do, and we use a lot. This is a graph of gas usage in millions of gallons a day. This is us. This is the next 20 top countries. Okay? They're trying to get where we are. I tell you, when I go to China and talk to students, you know what they want? They want a job. They want an apartment. They want a family. They want a washer, a dryer, 60,000-inch television, um, an iPod, an iPad. They want what we want. And I'm not averse to having to let them have it, but that's what is going on in the world. Just one, there's only a couple left here, and then I'll quit. <clears throat> this is a graph that shows the automobiles per thousand, well, actually motor vehicles, if you want to be technically correct, those in trucks and motorcycles, per thousand people in Sweden. And this is up here. Now, this is lately. If you go clear back, and this incidentally, this is GDP per capita. And there's just a straight line almost between the GDP and the number of motor vehicles. If you go way back to where Sweden was, pretty much at the end of like World War II, they were down here. Now China is clear down here at a whopping 16 motor vehicles per thousand people. 
So let's do a couple quick calculations. If China were to just get up to where Sweden was at the end of World War II in that time period, that would get them to 116 cars. So another 100 cars for every 1,000 people. <clears throat> 1.3 billion people is 1.3 million thousand people. And so another 100 cars per thousand people is another 130 million cars. If China just gets up to where Sweden was at the end of World War II, they're going to get a lot farther than that. Now, it's already a huge traffic jam and you can't move around. I don't know what they're going to do with that. But the point is, the, the Chinese would say, why do you blame us for climate change? I don't know exactly what they say. I've talked to them. And they'll say, look, 90% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere came from you guys, the developed world. When we get up to 50-50, let us know. Now, they're doing a lot. They really are. But every year in China, they put in as many coal plants as currently exist in Great Britain, every single year. And so, I mean, it's a huge, not faulting them, we've got a lot more than they do. But that's where we're going. Uh, that's where we are, incidentally, up there somewhere. W.C. Fields was in the hospital. Everybody knew he was dying. He was reading the Bible. Somebody asked him, why are you reading the Bible? You've never read the Bible in your life. He said, I'm looking for loopholes. And uh, anyway, there's no loopholes in the basic science of climate change. I've showed it to you today. Comes in, it's re-radiated back as a different frequency that is absorbed. Where this wasn't absorbed, this is. We're now absorbing more of it, so there's more heat. But to get rid of heat, the temperature must go up. And we don't know the effects yet because we can't predict weather 30 days out. We can't predict climate change 100 years in the future. Some will say we still have time. <clears throat> and I would suggest that since you're young, I'm 68, I probably won't be around. I would suggest that we probably don't have time. The reason, you put a pot of water on the stove and you turn the heat up. So let's assume that Mr. Spock, and does it boil immediately? No, it takes a while. Let's assume Mr. Spock comes along and beams about 400 gajillion billion tons of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. It goes from 390 parts a million up to, let's say, 600. Well, does the Earth's heat go right up? No, you know, you think, well, no, it didn't do that. Well, maybe it does that. And I'll tell you, well, that's not quite either correct, because as it starts to heat up, it will start radiating energy away, T to the fourth. And so it's radiating that. So what the actual heat looks like, it'll do that. But this is 80, 90 years out. We have right now baked in with the atmosphere that we have, with what we've put in the atmosphere, another couple degrees. We can't stop it. It's there. If we quit today, it's there. That's your problem, not mine. I mean, I may have caused it as an electric utility guy, but you're the ones that are going to live with it. The question, though, is what happens if that's a tipping point right there? So the answer is not do we still have more time. The question is that it's already too late. And I really worry because mainly because of methane and permafrost that it may be. Now, that's it. I'm going to, a couple more things. Actually, the steal this presentation. I always give this presentation away. If you can go out and give it yourself, if you want to go to high schools, Cub Scout packs, your college, feel free. You don't even need to mention my name. You can use every slide and use them. Dr. Salento's people put it on. There's the URL right there. You can download it from there if you wish. And as I say, each of these slides has articles. and It might have five or six URLs and sites to different things underneath it. So if you want to dig into it, you can go find it. So I'll leave that there in just a minute. Everybody is more than welcome to have that. It's Seamers College of Engineering and Mental Researches. <clears throat> and then once you get to webinar, you've got to go then <clears throat> click on Distinguished Lecture Series. Let that guy go away. We have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, or suffering. The only real question is what the mix is going to be. These are children from around the world that I've taken a picture of. That's my wife, and we were in, uh, that was Sao Tome and Principe, an island off the coast of Africa. I love this one. This was on a little island called Spitsbergen. It's at like 80 degrees north latitude. And when you go outside of a certain area outside of town, I don't care how old you are, you must have a high-powered rifle with you because of the polar bears. So that's a 16-year-old girl with a 30 out 6 sun over. They have a different kind of gun control law than we have. Uh, but, you know, uh, that's, that's who's going to have to live with it. 
must-see sites. If you really want to follow it, I would suggest climateprogress.org. It is an incredible site. It really, uh, Joe Rahm does just an incredible, Dr. Rahm is an MIT PhD and one of the most eminent bloggers. The Tom Friedman at the New York Times called that the indispensable blog. And that is it. I would be, are we going to do any questions or are we going to go, I'd be glad to take any slings or arrows. Thank you. Good. Okay, uh, uh, the dean said if you do have a question, come to the microphone if you do. be Because we're, we're webcasting this, and if not, I can repeat the question so the web people can hear it. Anybody? I've convinced everybody. I actually love to give this to whole groups of deniers because it gets, I'm a lawyer, I love to argue. So. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious, and maybe you could draw on your uh, history in the utility business. Uh, obviously, we spend so much time convincing people that climate change is a fact, it is real. And I wonder, should we spend most of our energy in trying to convince people that it's real? Because it does seem like at this point we're talking ourselves blue in the face about it. Or is it better to spend our energy in, in coming up with solutions and how to, how to make it better? I, you know, which is, which is the better strategy at this stage? Or do, is neither a strategy and we just go to mitigation and just say, hey, it's going to happen, forget it? You know, I, I am um, I'm pessimistic on the subject of fixing it. And the reason is there's so many countries in the world. Um, whether it's true or not, most people believe it will be expensive to fix it. Now, there's, other, there's people that say that, no, we can do it very cheaply, but we've got to start now. But many of the countries of the world... And basically, they look at us and say, well, you know, until you do something. And, but you get about 30 countries saying, until you do something, I'm not going to do something. It is a hard political question, because even where the cost and benefits are together, it's a hard question to find a solution. But where <clears throat> the costs are here in Morgantown tomorrow, and the benefits may be 5,000 miles away in 30 years in the future to people we don't even know, that's a tough political sell. And it really takes a Congress that is basically committed to the greater good. And I'm not dipping on the current Congress. There's been other locked Congresses. But right now, I don't see a lot of hope. Forget climate change for almost anything until we can get Congress unlocked. So I think that I, I worry a lot about this. I am not a fan of mitigation because of unintended consequences. You don't know what's going to happen. But I think we may be forced into that later. There is a lot we can do to adapt. I am a huge believer. I mean, when people say, what can you do is conserve, there are tons of ways of conserving. Now, I actually feel ashamed to be standing up here today talking about climate change. We have hybrids, cars and Lexus, the SUV hybrid. And I really, I also have a Corvette, but I hardly ever drive it. It's my toy. I'm an engineer. I must have a Corvette. But it probably gets 500 miles a year. But I'm joking. You know, I'm ashamed to be up here. I got to the Pittsburgh airport yesterday. And uh, I'd rented a car. I've got to be in Charleston tomorrow, Mount Area on Thursday, Charlotte on Friday. And then I'll just drive. It's a nice drive. And they said, oh, Mr. Bayless, I live at Avis. I get like two rental cars a week. We've got an upgrade for you. And this car needs to go to Charlotte. Oh, okay. So they gave me this tank of an SUV. Um, there are ways we can conserve. We have got to look at cafe standards of raising car efficiency standards at home. Any of the electrical engineers in the room will tell you about energy efficient motors energy-efficient light bulbs. I'm now, just for the heck of it, buying LED light bulbs. Now they're too expensive for the general public yet. I'm just trying them to see how I like them. I don't like the little curly things. They're hard to, not enough light, according to me. <clears throat> but I think that conservation is a huge thing. I think that the people that believe in climate science, we've got to do everything we can to, to both convince people and to look at ways of mitigation and adaptation there. Long answer. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much. Oh, one more question, Doctor. Yeah. I have two quick questions. Um, what impact do you believe CO2 regulations could actually make? And also, um, you mentioned developing countries we have over the world, like Africa and Asia. Like, this, is, this is literally going to add to an increase in energy consumption. Like, do you think it's realistic? Like, are we at a tipping point right now? or? We should be a lot more worried about the future. Yeah. 
the, uh, the, the question of what we do worldwide is not an easy question. There are many economies. Um, I'm going to be over Christmas in uh, Namibia and uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe. You, you can't really force those people to stop growing. I mean, there, there's a lot of starvation going on there now. There's a lot of very poor countries. One of the things we can do, though, we've, we've got to lead. Uh, we, can, we can find ways for small windmills, for small solar cells to give them electricity without polluting, without the CO2 that uh, comes along. So, I mean, in, in, the, in the, the less developed world, the people that are causing are the developed world and the developing world. And by that I mean China, India, Vietnam, the people that are really coming up in energy uses. I mean, I, uh, uh, Namibia is not a real problem. Of course, it's an absolute desert. Solar would work, at least in the eastern part. Solar would work great there. And I, I'm terribly sorry. I totally forgot the first question. Does anybody, what was the first? What is it? Oh, regulation. Yeah, I think, I think regulation, I, I happen to favor, I know the arguments on both sides, I favor cap and trade simply because I think it's all you can get done. I think people will go nuts over a carbon tax. Uh, but if you put cap and trade on, the beauty of a cap and trade scheme is, is we've used it for SO2. <clears throat> and let's say that Dr. Salento, the dean of engineering, and I both have power plants, and my power plant's really dirty. His is dirty. But he can save for $1 a ton. It might cost me $8 a ton. He can save enough to meet his rigs for $1 a ton and maybe pay $4 and save mine, and, and I'll pay him $5. Well, that's cheaper than me trying to do it for $8. So basically, cap and trade gets you the cheapest overall solution for the economy, which is what we want to be getting. I think I was I was just about got run out of a couple organizations of uh, I was calling for a carbon tax clear back in the 80s, and uh, obviously didn't get very far and used to have to stand with my back with another CEO Jim Rogers who's the CEO of Duke, and John Rowe who's the CEO of Exelon. The three of us clear back in the 90s were saying we got to do something, and but again Congress just won't is not going to do anything um, until it's too late. I mean, by the time climate change really, really kicks in, it's too late because of the 50, 70, 80, 90 year bacon period. And we're going to have to go to mitigation then. <clears throat> There's all kind of great mitigation schemes of putting balloons up and reflecting sunlight, big mylar balloons and sulfur dioxide particles high in the atmosphere and a lot of neat things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bayliss. I think part of the reason why there aren't a lot of questions is the information is quite overwhelming. Um, and, and for a generation that's actually going to have to to deal with it, I think it's also quite frightening. Um, so I want you to know that we deeply appreciate you being here, and it was quite a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of the lecture series. Joyce, thanks for hosting us here at the World College of Law.